story of glass it only gets stronger and stronger and i mean that literally here we are once again james hollis has been with us before but today it's a completely different story we're here at the ndtv tech conclave and the corning demonstration and experience area is going through an absolute riot James, you and I were actually supposed to be doing this right out there at the Corning demo area. And as we can see right now from all these pictures, that's not possible, right? I mean, we'd have to have uh, bouncers and security like in a nightclub to pull that off. That's right. But that only goes on to show the amount of interest that consumers actually have in something that was literally transparent to them at one time. Nobody thought of glass. Mm. Today, uh, there's, a, there's a, a saying that goes out that you touch glass the most in terms of all materials in the world because of the amount of interaction that you do with your phones, with your tablets. Glass plays a very important role, but we may not know it. So let's talk a little bit about what you've showcased out here at the Corning demo area, besides, of course, your 100-pound gorilla. That, of course, is, I think, the, the big, big, big showcase item, and everybody's loved it. But let's talk about what all have you really showcased out here that's got everybody so interested. Well, I think we have three general areas, um, one being kind of the innovation history area where we walk through some of the key products that we've brought to market over the years. And it's a specific area that features Gorilla Glass devices, typically phones here for, in the interest of space, some Gorilla Glass 5 devices, Gorilla Glass 3. Mm -hmm. And then there's a, a third area that I think sparked a lot of interest that we saw when I was over at the booth earlier around the live demos. Right, okay. absolutely. Um, on the innovation side, when you walk through that particular space, there's a specific reference to CRT, as we were the first uh, uh, first to develop the process for the all glass CRT. I'm remiss, I, I, probably the most important, and the first one in the line is the light bulb for, the to, for Thomas yes. Edison. And then we talk about optical fiber and Gorilla Glass as well. So it's amazing, and I, a lot of people, I think we spoke about it last time also, but a lot of people may not know about the fact that Corning has played a stellar part in some of the biggest innovations that change mankind. The light bulb, the television, actually screen tube, both CRT as well as the LCD, and then optical fiber, which today runs the greatest innovation of mankind, internet, and everything else. So you've played some great roles out there. But today, when you look back and talk about Corning Gorilla Glass as a category, as a factor, uh, more people touch Corning Gorilla Glass today on their smartphones than anything else in the world because you're on so many different phones. Is this now also something that Corning looks at as one of the innovations that has changed mankind? I think, it's a, I think in some ways we do. I think it's difficult to understand the magnitude years or decades down the road. Uh, the next wave, the next generation of Corning uh, employees and colleagues, they'll look back and it'll be on that wall of fame okay. like some of the other innovations that we've done before. Okay. I, I heard something interesting today when we had John Bain give his keynote that uh, if you were to take the first ever Corning Gorilla Glass and make it go through, the thickness would remain the same, and make it go through the same process that Corning Gorilla Glass 5 goes through, it may almost be unbreakable, mm -hmm. right? But would people actually uh, consider a phone with something that is that so thick, and a phone also that would be very thick? Have you ever considered this? Has, have you and a company ever sat down and said, let's make an unbreakable phone? Because that was a very interesting thought process. Mm -hmm. Has that ever happened? Well, we have conversations like that all the time. I think the piece around thickness and reliability, there's just a natural, um, a natural reliability set that goes along with scales with thickness. Um, what we choose to do when we innovate is we give the device maker and, and designer a tool set, and they can choose to run thicker or stay at an incumbent thickness, or they can choose to move thinner. The majority of what's happened over the years is people have gone thinner. Um, though we've continued to improve uh, glass reliability, we want one day there to be basically under normal conditions uh, a glass that's very, very hard to fail or, or, or it doesn't fail. Right. And so we continue to innovate in that space. But when we talk to our customers about the design choices and trade-offs, we always talk to them about how the glass will respond or react at a given thickness. Whether it's one millimeter thick or 0.5 millimeter thick or anywhere in between, we work with them uh, with regards to their phone design and also the cover glass thickness itself. Uh, to try to help them develop what reliability set best fits their segment or their needs. The last time I met you, you and me had a fascinating conversation that had millions of people actually uh, completely intrigued by the thought that 
going and making a phone is a collaboration between you and the, and the producer of the phone, mm. and there are multiple areas that need to be looked into, sure. including how thin the device itself is, mm -hmm. the material they've used, the kind of reinforcement that they do around maybe the corners, the shock areas, and everything else. Sure. Has anything changed? Because at that point, you'd also said that people, uh, most manufacturers will uh, trade style and design versus maybe making your phone more robust. Has that thought process changed? Because we are still seeing thinner, more curved glass becoming a de facto standard, right. a larger screen. Uh, the, the, the bezel going away has become now maybe the greatest style statement. Are we now looking at more vulnerability in a phone? I mean, we have glass in the front, we have glass at the back, and as less protection as possible. Mm. Is this something that excites you, or is this something that makes you a little nervous? It's, it's very exciting for us. It also, it's also very challenging. So like I mentioned before, we give that tool set, we improve the glass. Most um, device designers have made the cover glass or the display set itself thinner. Uh, sometimes that gives them volume inside of the phone mm -hmm. to add battery. Right. Sometimes it just allows them to make a, uh, make a thinner device. I think where we emphasize um, from a material set standpoint is this is what the product can do. Uh, with regards to your design, let's really zero in on stiffness, on um, um, how, the, uh, how the bevels protect or don't protect the glass, et cetera, and then what do you really want to provide for a consumer experience? And then we work to give them the best, uh, the best set of design rules that, that we can for a given design. But I think the, the piece that I see that doesn't seem to be going away is that there is a very significant design element. It's almost, it's almost a piece of, it's a, it's, a, it's a big tool for us, but it's almost a piece of jewelry also. Right. And the design element, I don't see that going away. Um, and when we've provided that tool set, people have either gotten more aggressive on design or thickness, and that just keeps us going back to the table from an innovation standpoint to continue to improve. So, so, so this entire idea that today there is more glass vis visible than ever before, where a small little spot <coughs> on the top is all that makes up the entire bezel, where borderless design has become the de facto standard for premium luxury. In fact, it's already been declared that uh, you know, the thinner the, the shoulder as well as the lip and the bottom of the right. phone, the more chances of that phone will actually have to sell it because it's become a design standard. Does that make it, as you said, it has made it very challenging, but does that make you also move towards maybe the next level where because style standards will now dictate mm. the toughness that is required, does Corning have to step up to the plate even more? Well, we actually, again, we like the challenge. It continues to keep pressure on us to continue to innovate. Um, we take, we, we live and die on data. Okay. And the data tells us that when glass fails, most of the time, it's because of impact with sharp surface. Um, like you mentioned, the area now that is susceptible to that type Correct. of damage is, is increased exponentially. And, and so we have to continue uh, to work on that and improve there. So. Um, Based on what the data tells us, damage resistance and impact resistance continues to be what we need to work on. And um, with all of our innovations, at least in the, the near term going forward, it looks like that's where we'll continue to focus. Gorilla Glass 4 was the first um, specifically focused glass for us on drop at a meter. Right. Um, Gorilla Glass 5, uh, 1.6 meters. And you can imagine that our innovation set a roadmap based on the feedback we get from desi device designers and also from the, the market and the testing that we do, we'll continue to work on sharp surface impact. Okay, I almost got hopeful because you said Gorilla Glass 4 and then 5. I thought you were about to make an announcement for Gorilla <laughs> Glass 6. And, and look, it <clears throat> is a lot of people watching right now. Right. You could make this the launch of Gorilla Glass 6, right? Yeah, I understand, I understand. <laughs> well, I think you know we're, we're an innovation company, as John talked about this morning, 167 years old this year. Um, you can imagine we have a roadmap. We're continuously innovating. And at the right time, uh, when, when, when it uh, comes the right time to make an announcement about whatever's next, whenever it's ready, we'll make that. All right. So you heard it here first. It'll happen. It's happening soon. <laughs> okay. So let's get down to one or two of the other very interesting things that have come out today on this day of glass, right? And that is the usage of Corning Gorilla Glass in not the typical areas like a smartphone front and back, but mm -hmm. in laptops, in tablets in automobiles, in the industrial sector and architecture. Uh, 
And then I also spoke to Scott about this, and uh, it is interesting that whenever you think of the future, whether it's science fiction, whether it's books, whether it's movies, transparency is taken to be futuristic, right? The more glass you have, the more futuristic you are, right? Mm. So is that something that, again, of course, for Corning, that's, that's great news, but is that something that you're geared up for because... It is very different from everything that you may be doing right now. The more the automotive side becomes full of glass, and yet they want it to be lighter weight, right? Is that something that you're up now up to? Can eventually Corning provide all the glass used in a car? Oh, absolutely. We, we feel like that, um, that uh, we're kind of unparalleled with regards to what we're able to do from an innovation and R&D standpoint. Um, we have groups specifically already in place that focus on architectural, focus on appliance, focus on automotive, uh, while at a, at a, at a more um, near-term focus for, this, for the uh, guerrilla-based business, we focus on consumer electronics. So uh, it really doesn't matter for us, the industry. What we make sure that we understand that we do is understand the use case in each specific segment, and then we gear, uh, we gear our efforts, value prop, uh, interaction with the customer, um, the, very much the same way. We collaborate early, we collaborate often um, in the innovation process. From an automotive standpoint, we're already um, quite embedded both in automotive interior and also some work with the exterior as well, bringing a, a weight value prop mm -hmm. along with that damage resistance with, uh, okay. with Gorilla Glass. So we're quite embedded there and I think we're up to the challenge. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about the future of glass. I had this conversation with John, with Scott now. Mm -hmm. I really need inputs from you on this. So the way the market is changing hmm. is the perception of what a consumer wants, and mainly it's all guesswork right now. A lot of people are speaking about the fact that you may never have to touch the surface, you know, the, 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 the glass touch that is being used right now may not be required because there'll be enough sensor technology where your finger hovers over the glass mm -hmm. and you know it. The second part of it is flexible, bendable mm -hmm. screens, right? And this seems to be the two that fascinate the customers the most, right? Is that something where Corning seems to think that that's a good value proposition in the future? Or is that something that takes away from where you are right now? Well, that's a great question. And I think, again, for Corning to be 167 years old, uh, we have to be cognizant of changes in technology, and we can't be afraid to change and move along with that. I think from a display standpoint, um, our use cases for our device, and as we look at those and interface with those, um, it has to be pristine, it has to be very clear, um, and it has to allow the user to experience this great display uh, that they're interacting with. Uh, whether it's gesture recognition, whether it's voice, etc., cetera, um, we're cognizant of that, um, but again, we know that the consumer is still going to look at their device. Correct. Um, and they're still going to want that to be... In fact, I think be... he'll want it much more now because there isn't going to be so much of fingerprints and there's no finger that's constantly exactly. actually coming exactly. in out there. You're just hovering somewhere on the top. So he'll want it to be even more clear and, and a better experience, it's, right? They're still going to want damage resistance. They're still going to want a pristine surface uh, that they can enjoy that display through. Yeah. Okay. Uh, with regards to flexible, uh, we have two or three flexible classes and we're engaged, obviously, with... Uh, with the marketplace on what they want to do uh, with bendable displays. I think the use case for, uh, for that type of display is one that's not clearly defined yet. Um, but you can imagine the same way, the same formula that we work, whether it's, um, whether it's glass and display for the LCD industry, whether it's Gorilla, whether it's the automotive industry and, and, and our environmental products division, it doesn't matter. We use the same formula. We, we collaborate early, we sit down with the researchers, we sit down with designers, try to understand what are you trying to do, how can we help, and we go to work. Great, James Hollis, as always, it's been fantastic speaking with you. I think between what we were able to see on stage today, the, the story of glass, the era of technology, how glass has always played a great role in it. This experience center, I think for most people in India especially, we constantly refer to it as the torture chamber. You call it uh, an area where you can actually come and experiment with the exactly. glass. We call it the Corning Gorilla Glass Torture Chamber. All of it is, I think, an incredible move forward for everybody out here. People can truly now understand that it isn't just a slab of glass. There's right. a lot more to that. Thank Absolutely. you so much. I hope you'll keep coming back and speaking with us. It's always fascinating to talk about glass. We will absolutely continue to come back. I want to congratulate NDTV and yourself and Vikram on a wonderful initial technology conclave. It's been great. I'm sure it's a great uh, um, leap 
uh, leap, leapfrog for the future. And I wish you all the best. Yes, absolutely. Seeing the crowds and the interest and everything else, I think uh, it's been already very successful. So we thank you for it. Thank you so much. Thanks thank a you lot. so much. Thank Congratulations. You, thank you. All right. Thank you. quickly ask one question both to my panel as well as to everybody out there uh, with a show of hands. How many of you have taken a Facebook quiz uh, which basically asked you questions to find out how closely you resemble a particular celebrity in Hollywood? How many of you have taken that quiz? Okay, you're, 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 you're lying, right? Okay. You, you didn't take that quiz? You didn't take that quiz? Okay. How many of you here have taken a Facebook quiz ever? Okay, one person. So one person is truthful, the other three are lying. Let's find out now from the rest of the audience. How many of you people have ever taken a Facebook quiz? Okay, keeping those hands up, which is 95%. Do you realize that each of you have already been hacked, right? So you and every friend of yours, that data was already sucked out. So those those millions that have been uh, going through this entire situation in India, and most of you have done it on your mobile phone, so the amount of data that came from within is just the start of what we eventually may end up with. So let's get started with where we are. Rajan, I'm going to start off with you. The mobile phone, and of course, the incredible organization that you're part of. How bad do you think the situation is? The first question I always get, always get is, we are just creating panic. It's pretty widespread because if you ask this congregation or this audience how many of you folks have smartphones, just about everybody will raise their hand. And if you ask the same crowd how many of you folks have a firewall installed, a sort of a software that protects you in some part, only about 2%, we've tried this over and over again, 2% say they lift up their hands and they say we have some type of a Something protection. Something that actually That's is it. And they're carrying a advanced computer in their pockets, which they would never think of doing on a laptop or on desktop, but they feel completely compelled on a smartphone to not have that type but of But why problem. do you think that is? That's why is it, is, is it just because it's in your hand, you feel it's very personal and protected? Because I've got people who've actually answered this saying, but it's always with me, so how is it insecure? I think it's, it's this transition from voice to data. I okay. think people, when they've you know, okay. used the voice, never had to bother about this type of intervention and hacking and all of this. And all of a sudden they think, hey, you know, moving over to a same phone and it's data enabled, all of a sudden should give me the same types of uh, protections and lack of vulnerability, which is not the case because you've really moved and taken a quantum leap from right. two very different networks. And I think that's what causes this false sense of safety and not doing the essential hygiene that is required when you're in this new data network environment. Correct. I think it's pretty worse because the entire landscape of security threat has changed in the last 10 years from those dinosaur-sized computers to laptops, then to tablets, and today to mobile phones. That's the most lucrative option for hackers. A, because if you are clogged by a ransomware on your you know, computer, you are, and, and compared to a mobile phone, you're more likely to pay a higher price for unlocking your mobile phone. Correct. Uh, number two, the quantum of personal data you can steal from a mobile phone is much more lucrative than from a PC, because if you hack a computer, at best you can find some documents or photos maybe, but if you take over a smartphone, uh, your entire gallery, contact book, locations of your entire lifetime, uh, what all accounts you have, screenshots, WhatsApp, and you're looking, you know, your life, will be taken off like a live web camera, you know, and a hacker would have everything you do. And, you know, things you can't even imagine, you wouldn't ever remember in your life that where were you three years back on this day at this point of time. But the location log, everything can be stolen. And it's, it's more easier to hack a smartphone than to hack a PC today.